a transgression. Now, let me just draw this distinction. If I'm forgiving others of their transgressions, I don't think that's the same as a spiritual transgression to God. I don't think this is sin. This is talking about someone hurting me. Okay? So forgiveness is used within the, within the context of someone hurting me. I am to pour it out, to send it away. It's also used in connection with sin in Luke chapter 5 and verse 20. Seeing their faith, Jesus said, uh, he said, friend, your sins are forgiven. So forgiveness is also associated with those things that are done against God. We can forgive what people have transgressed against me. God is capable of forgiving the sinfulness that people have engaged in. It's used in Matthew chapter 6 in relationship to debt. Forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. Those things that are owed, those things that if the ledger was going to be balanced, something needs to happen. And this word forgiveness is used in connection with that, that kind of balancing. And then lastly in uh, Acts chapter 8, it's used in connection with the thought and the heart when Simon has sought to purchase the gift of the Holy Spirit. Therefore repent of this wickedness of yours and pray that the Lord if possible, the intention of your heart may be forgiven you. So we've got the thoughts and the heart that are connected with this concept of forgiveness as well. So forgiveness includes sending away a trespass that's been done against you. Forgiveness includes sending away the guilt of a sin that has been committed. Forgiveness includes sending away what you think you might be owed and forgiveness includes sending away the motivation which may have caused that harm. Boy, that, that's, that's, a, that's a pretty complete picture of forgiveness. But there's another Greek word that also is translated by our English word forgive. And it's the word charizomai. Has its roots in the word grace. Means to bestow a favor unconditionally to bestow a favor without condition. Again, as we look to some of the association that, uh, that we find, it's used to describe, first of all, the divine act of forgiveness. Colossians chapter 2, Paul says, We were dead in our transgressions and the uncircumcision of our flesh, but He made you alive together with Him, having forgiven us all our transgressions. So it's used in reference to how God has forgiven, how God has forgiven all of our transgressions. Colossians chapter 3 is another place where that uh, also appears. So as those who have been chosen of God, holy and beloved, put on a heart of compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience, bearing with one another and forgiving each other, whoever has a complaint against anyone, just as the Lord forgave you, so also should you. It's also used of human action. Luke chapter 7, the, the, money, the, uh, the money lender who has two debtors, and one owed him 500 and another 50. They were unable to play, pay, but he graciously forgave them. So which one, Jesus said, which one of those is going to love him more? And you remember the response is, I suppose, the one who he, he forgave the most. Also, it's used in, uh, in the human action of giving comfort. In 1 Corinthians, Paul has referenced a gentleman who is so entrapped in sin that he tells the church they need to take action to help this man escape by withdrawing their connection to him. They do so, and as a result of that, the man is awakened spiritually, and he comes back. And in 2 Corinthians, Paul referenced that particular event, and he says, sufficient for such a one is the punishment which was inflicted by the majority. In other words, you, you, you withdrew yourselves from this man, and now then, now then he's come back. He, he has gotten the spiritual point. And so now, he says, rather forgive and comfort him. Otherwise, such a one may be over, overwhelmed with excessive sorrow. So now this word is used in this unconditional giving of comfort to someone who was guilty of sin but has changed their life, who has repented and come back. He says, now you extend this comfort to them. And it's also used as a sign of tenderness, a sign of our tenderness. Ephesians chapter 4, 
where be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving each other, just as God in Christ also has forgiven you. You see, granting forgiveness as an unconditional gift shows our tenderness. And that's what Ephesians 4 says. Okay, so biblical forgiveness, we put all of this together, is a pouring out or a sending away of hurtful and sinful events. It is an extending of unconditional favor which releases debt, offers comfort, and proves the tenderness of the one granting the forgiveness. That's what biblical forgiveness is all about. Now, within that understanding, I want to share with you some things that two doctors in their book entitled The Cho Choosing to Forgive Workbook, some things that they say about forgiveness. And, and the reason I want to share them is because, first of all, they may strike you as kind of odd. But when evaluated within the framework of Scripture and the filter of Scripture that we've just looked at, I think we'll be able to build upon these things and to identify much of the truth that, they, that is contained in them. Neither one of these gentlemen, they're not writing from a Christian perspective, they're just writing as clinical doctors about the whole concept of forgiveness. First of all, they say forgiveness is not letting go of healthy forms of anger. Forgiveness is not letting go of healthy forms of anger. There's no no question, there are unhealthy forms of anger that need to be released and, and anger leads to sin and we need to make sure that we don't allow that to happen and give the devil a foothold is how Ephesians puts that. But forgiveness is not always letting go of a healthy anger. Number two, it is not becoming content with your thoughts and needs being disrespected. Forgiveness isn't, well, I guess I just should just say nothing. I guess I should not address this. I guess if I'm going to forgive, I should just keep my mouth quiet. Now, there may be times that is the best conclusion, but it doesn't mean that in order for me to forgive, I always need to be silenced. I also do not need to be the doormat for the wrongdoer. Oh, I'm, I'm going to forgive, so therefore I need to lay myself down, and allow someone to mistreat me. Now, forgiveness may cause us to do that. It did Jesus. There were occasions when our Savior laid himself down and was used as a doormat because he was going to forgive. There were other times he did not do that, where he stood face to face, toe to toe, and addressed people with issues in their life. And he did so in a spirit of love, but he was not going to be a doormat all the time. Forgiveness also is not needing to be best friends with the offender. How many times have we evaluated our ability to forgive and felt like, well, you know, I, I'm just not back to being what I once had, and so I must not have forgiven someone. Well, forgiveness may not mean that. Next, forgiveness is not pretending to go back to normal relations. Forgiveness isn't pretending, and I think that's the key word here. It's not a pretense. It's not acting as though. And then uh, forgiveness also is not denying that you might have to live with pain caused by a wrongful deed. Forgiveness is not, oh, this shouldn't hurt anymore. And we will address a little bit maybe uh, the concept of forgive and forget. Uh, it's, it's not from Scripture. You know, it... it <laughs> Forgetting can be dangerous, but uh, forgiveness isn't always about trying to not have pain any longer. They go on and identify three things, though, that they think forgiveness is. And again, remember, this is they're writing from a totally secular perspective. Forgiveness is letting go of the demands for repayment, especially after unsuccessful attempts to reconcile. Forgiveness is letting go of the demands for repayment. How many times do we attach that to our concept of forgiveness? Someone needs to do such and such so that I can forgive. Interesting. Number two, 
being willing to refrain from the ongoing temptation to control or to punish the wrongdoer. You gentlemen go into quite a discussion about how oftentimes our failure uh, to forgive is really a control issue. It's not so, it's not so much that, that we're afraid of, uh, of what might happen or not happen in relationship, but it's because we really want the control. Because usually if we've been hurt, then somebody else has had control. And so as we seek to, if you will, <laughs> get even in the stage of hurtfulness, <laughs> then we think we need control. And so I'm not going, I'm not going to let this go unpunished. Somebody else might be able to, but I'm not going to be able to. And then uh, number three, forgiveness is a forward view of life versus a backward, which in actuality brings new opportunities. You see, the failure to forgive is always a backward focus. There's no exception to that. If I'm not forgiving, it's over something that has happened. So what that does is that sticks me in a vision that is backwards. Forgiveness enables me to look forwards. Newness, new opportunities. And those are the three things that those gentlemen identify as being part of what forgiveness is. And again, in the course of our study, we'll, we'll see some of the validities of, of their comments. When it comes to enjoying the blessings of dwelling in the grace house, forgiveness is not, an, is not optional, but it's a discipline that we, we must learn and we must consistently practice. Now, I, I think there's a reason for that. Over and over, and, and we, we read one occasion of it, but uh, James talks about that if, if you and I go on and, and pass judgment against a brother, that we're passing judgment against the law. Who's the lawgiver? It's God. And so if, if I'm unwilling to forgive while trying to live in the grace house, how can I expect to abide in God's grace? The two are impossible. It's the greatest oxymoron of Christianity for us to go around with grudges and not forgiving and expect to live in God's grace house. It makes no sense. And so that's why the Bible is so emphatic about, if I'm going to live in God's grace, I must be a forgiving servant. I must be a forgiving servant. Over the next few Sundays, we're going to take uh, time and we're going to share some strategies and some, some things about forgiveness. Because I don't know, I'm just going to t say this just right out here, I don't know of a single Christian that doesn't wrestle with forgiveness. We may not all have the same trials and the same temptations and, and engage in some of the same sins, but I'll tell you what, everybody sitting in here has a hard time forgiving. I see lots of heads shaking. And nobody's going like this. Oh, we, we may not have a hard time forgiving some folk, but we wrestle with it with something else. There is something in there that Forgiveness is difficult. It's hard. And so this, this is really an important topic for us to address if we're going to le le live in the grace house. And what a great song for us to end with. His grace reaches me. And because it reaches me, I need to be a conduit, and it needs to reach you through me. I need to learn to forgive. As we sang this song this morning, if you have a need that you'd like to share with the body, this would be a time to do that. If, uh, if you just need to dedicate yourself again to really developing and working on a forgiving spirit so that you can enjoy all the beauties of God's grace house, then what a great song to motivate that. As we sing this this morning, if you have any of those needs, please engage in doing that. Come and let us